Hello, my friends, and welcome back. I am very excited for our guest today. Today we have Jay Williams. He is runs a YouTube channel called Black Dad. He is a former middle school uh, history teacher. He taught for seven years. And he's also the father to two beautiful babies. One is a little girl who's eight and then a little boy who is five. And he is an unschooler. So I'm super excited to have you on today, Jay. Thank you so, so much for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stoked. You're, uh, you're uh, epic in my mind for a lot of reasons. So um, um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> I appreciate that. My kids would probably disagree with you, but, <laughs> but I'm super excited to have you on. Um, so let's talk first. Uh, let's talk about teaching first and okay. and th what that has looked like for you, why you became a teacher, uh, a little bit of a, about your teaching career. Let's let's talk about that. So um, I always I've always enjoyed helping people and um, and helping them, you know, mature into who they want to be, um, helping them, assisting them in a, whatever progress or process that they're in. And I've. I mean, I felt like that from elementary. I remember teaching a kid. So, you know, literally on the school playground playing kickball. And there was this one kid who was not good and um, and teaching him how to catch the ball. Right. I remember sit, pu pulling him to the side and taking 10 minutes to teach him. And, you know, and we only had 20 minutes to play. So I'm taking <laughs> half the time just to teach him to the side to catch the ball and and I remember, and then we played and he, he kicked the ball. It wasn't that day, but like maybe a week or so later, um, they kicked the ball to him and he caught it and like the look on his face. And I think I was in third grade then, fourth grade then. And the joy that I, that I realized that I could receive joy from helping others, you know, receive that kind of joy. And, and from then I wanted to just help people um, to learn and to progress. It started as a coach. Um, I started coaching when I was 19, basketball, coaching basketball. Um, I still coach now. And um, and I initially didn't want to be a teacher because uh, teachers don't really make the most money. <laughs> <laughs> and um, how am I going to pay for the mansion with the moat around it um, and right, my, right. <laughs> my Bugattis with, on a teacher salary, you know? But um, so I... Uh, but I realized as I got older and I got after I graduated college and I got into the real world that money doesn't motivate me. I'm not motivated by money at all. And so I said, I'm going to do this. I've always had this passion for young people in particular. I've always had this passion for helping people. So I was like, that's a teacher by definition, yeah. at least my thoughts. And um, that's what led me into uh, wanting to pursue going into the classroom. And why history? What made you choose history as your content area? Oh, I, I love history. I, I man, I history is just amazing. It's, it's like I love movies, and and you know, some people love books and things like that. I, I really love movies, and to me, picture the best movie ever created. Whatever the storyline, whatever happened, that's history. Like history is literally yeah. everything: the romance, the drama, the action, the the suspense, the thrillers, the thrills, the it's the mysteries, you know, um, the horror, you know, all of it. Like it's everything that you can imagine from the greatest movie ever created. And um, when you d delve into these things and realize actual people, people like you and I, live through these things and um, experience these things or accomplish these things, it just, yeah, it's. It, it just, yeah, it's just an amazing feeling. Um, so um, that's why I liked it because of <laughs> an, in, an intense appreciation and love for history. But um, so uh, that was just an easy pick for me because because uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, to there's a phrase I always say um, with basketball to teach is to learn twice. So teaching them is gives me the opportunity to learn more about history and to experience more about some of those fun stories that we talked about. I love it. So you taught seven years and you taught middle school, correct? Yes. Yes. Talk, six, about, talk been, about that. I taught six and eighth graders. Six and eighth? Yes. Very nice. So, so talk about your experience then, um, teaching what that looked like for you in the, in the public school system, which you went through the public school system, correct? Yes. Yeah. So I was, uh, so, um, going back. So when I went to school, I wasn't a good student initially. So elementary, I was 
probably I would say on the bottom half. Uh, uh, middle school, I was probably more average. And in high school, I was an honor roll student. And from hindsight 2020, I think I just figured out the game of it, yeah. um, the game of school. And I knew just enough to get the grades that were acceptable in my household. My mom was extremely strict. So uh, my elementary years wasn't the best. <laughs> Let me say it like that. But high school was, <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, to get up, get you off my back, all I do, you have to get it is A. Oh, that's easy. I'll figure that out. But, um, Jump through those hoops. <laughs> exactly, right? So um, so, so uh, there's always, but I remember being in the classroom, even at a young age, and I was like, why did the teacher say it like that or do it like, they should have did it this way or man, if they did it like this, it'll be so much better. And this is actually interesting. Like, why didn't they present it in a, you know, a more interesting way? And um, when I got that, that finally conceded, so I'm going to be a teacher, um, I said, I want to be the teacher that I never had, right? And so some of the principles that I get from all the teachers that I'd loved and appreciated, I wanted to combine all of that with some of that extra sauce that I feel like I, I could bring to the classroom. And so what that looked like was a picture, whatever, you remember, I love movies, I love TV. So whatever TV show or movie was popular at the time, uh, <laughs> it was a huge theme in the classroom of that year. So Game of Thrones was <laughs> hugely possible, uh, uh, popular. So I called my classroom The Realm um, and I was the Lord of the Realm and, um, you know, and they had their different roles and things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I'm extremely competitive. Um, I, I'm, I, you know, I, <laughs> I talk trash to my kids, you know, playing Uno, you know, and, and exploding kittens, but, awesome. um, <laughs> but it's, you know, and, and now they do it to me now. I was like, oh man. And now, and, and the funny thing is, so I'm going off tangent. The funny thing is they figured out if they work together, they can beat me almost every time. <laughs> I was like, and then, now I'm really, I want them to learn that lesson, but I'm really frustrated because now I'm losing all the time. It's like, oh my goodness. So now I'm trying to parlay and be, Hey, why don't you be my partner? You know, but, um, anyways, so I, um, my classroom is extremely competitive. We did a lot of different things to kind of spark that energy. So boys, athletes loved my class and any, um, kids who loved reading loved my class. Um, kids who love stories, movies, and things like that love my class. Cause these are all the things that, um, I really, um, kind of, the environment that it cult was cultivated in the classroom. Um, and I, I used to get in trouble all the time. Uh, my class was loud because we were playing games and, and, yeah. and um, there was so much, uh, there was so, I mean, it's all kind of games. I mean, I, I, they're probably dated now because this is a few years ago, but you used to Quizlet and quizzes and Kahoot and, and there was games that I made up and stuff. And like, there was this one, we used to call it a uh, Mortal Kombat. Um, that because I liked video games as a kid, and um, so the kids would come up and rock paper scissors, to, and whoever won, won would uh, get to an answer a question, the trivia question, which was a question on the test, and um, and they would they would be so into it. We would have the music blasting like do 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 do. This the music. <laughs> It's like Mortal Kombat, and it all rock paper scissors, and they, they would like get so into it. But um, and I always felt like history isn't sitting quietly in a book you know, in absolute silence, answering multiple choice questions. Like history is loud. History is domineering. History is dramatic, you know? And, um, and I felt like we, to get the context of what was being experienced, like we need to create that kind of environment as much as possible within reason, you know, like, like how do you talk about the, the, the 300, the Greek 300 going against the, the Roman, um, per, um, the, not Roman, the Persian army, you know, with their, you know, thousands of soldiers and the, this idea that their army was so vast that they drank all the water leading to the, the uh, uh, Sparta, you know, and to Greece, the Greek city state. And, you know, that they stomped so loud that it was like an earthquake as they moved, as the armies moved toward them. You know, like, like, how do you do that quiet? You know, it's like you read, you read that silently, you know, no, it's like you, you got to be loud. We got to be outside. You know, we got to be dramatic. We got to be have emphasis. Like imagine the feeling that you would have when you literally hear the people coming to you, thousands and thousands of them, when you only have uh, 300 of you about to go against the greatest army that the world has ever seen. You know, that's like I want them to be in the shoes of those those 300 Spartans, you know, and you can't do that silently. So. 
um, a lot of reenactments, a lot of, uh, you know, I like drama and uh, uh, there, there were some theatrical elements of, of my classroom. Um, as I got better, because, you know, when I, my first year, you know, was follow the cookie cutter stuff, you know? Yeah. And then as I got better, I realized, okay, games and choice um, allow creativity. That was my focus. So by my last year, we had zero test like the traditional test that you would, you know, um, do yeah. you know, multiple choice questions or short, uh, short fill in the blanks. We almost had zero of those. Your assessments was a creative project. Um, and, and, you know, teaching them research and, you know, looking into context and bias and, um, collaboration of, of different sources and things like that. Um, and is this a trustworthy source? You know, where did it come from? You know, is it Wikipedia, you know, or is it from, you know, an archive, a national archive and things like that? Um, and they were able to present that information in a variety of different ways. So they could, they could do a performance, they can do a monologue, they can, do a diorama, which is like a little project, little poster kind of um, dimensional poster thing. Um, they could do a, a movie trailer. Um, they, uh, I mean, it was, it was so, it was like 20 something different options of ways that they could present the information. Um, and I, uh, one kid, one, one kid made a, a comic book and I was like, it was really, really good. I was like, wow, this, I'm like, kid, you need to, you I almost said his name. You need to publish this. Like, it was that good. Like, it was exceptional. Um, I'm pretty sure he's going to be an author one day. Like, it's, I said that all the time. He even looks like he has his little glasses. He, you know, has this little stoic look. He looks like a little author. I'm like, look at this guy, you know. But, um, and he was a sixth grader. It was, I was so astonished about how creative and amazing these young minds were, particularly when you allowed them to choose the way they wanted to present their learning. It was like, oh my goodness. And, and I, and I kept running into roadblocks with it um, in the classroom. Um, other teachers didn't like me um, because of a lot of different reasons. Uh, I, my class was loud. Um, they felt like we played too many games. There's no real learning and playing games. Um, That's where all the learning happens. I know, right? I know, right? Yeah, tell me about it. Preach, preach, you know. But, um, yeah. and, um, and so there was one thing that I did. One, my, I think this was my second to last year. Yeah, my second to last year. So this was the year right before COVID. Um, I I read about, you know, different creative ways, because that's another thing. I, I don't like reading, by the way, Janae. Like, <laughs> I know that's probably a bad thing to say. I don't like reading, but I do love learning. I absolutely love learning, you know? And um, so because I wanted to be the best teacher, like I said, I wanted to be the teacher that I never had, right? With the best qualities of everyone. Um, I realized I had to, you know, see different ideas what are other teachers doing all over the country and so i was reading different books about stuff and i don't know which book i was reading that i got this idea where they were they were talking about take the test twice it's like take the test twice so it's like so picture a regular his, history test right for, that you would have in high school and you would take the test by yourself and then you would get with a group of people um use about three or four of you and then you would take the test again before you know what the correct answers are, before you have access to books again, and you will work together to take the test twice. And um, and I and I, I don't know why, but I was like, man, that seems like an amazing idea. And I tr I presented it in my classroom, my eighth grade class, and it did so well. Like is what I loved was not so much them the grade but the conversation that they had. No, the answer is this because of this, this, this. Remember we talked about this and blah, 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 blah. And, and I was like, this is what I want. I, I want them to advocate for why they feel like it's the right answer. I want them to disagree. And and, I, and there was even times where one kid was like, oh, I'm not going to change my answer. I'm pretty sure it's this. <laughs> like, you know, I was like, I love it. Like, this is what we want. Like, this is real learning, collaboration, creativity. You know, it's not just regurgitating information back that you heard, you know, it's like you can have your own original thoughts um, different than the group. Right. And that's OK. That's all right. And I'm not going to punish you for that. And even the fact that I had to give them a grade after it, it, it bothered me because what I really wanted was what I got in the experience of them debating about this test, you know. And so anyways, that got out <laughs> that I did that at practice. And the teachers didn't like it. They feel like it's cheating. It's like, oh, uh, just kids are just going to sit there and copy each other's answers. And it's like, oh. it's like you guys are so, I was like, let's show short-sighted. And then the, 
And so, so I got in trouble for that. It, those are like an example of things I would get in trouble for. Like be, I would think outside the box in so many different ways and, um, and want to do some, but I also did bring some things to my school too. Like we had this thing called history fair, which was, so you remember I talked about how we had various dis different types of presenting, uh, in their learning. So they would do it at history fair. They limited a little bit because mine was extremely expensive, but they limited it down to like five different ways that they could present their information. And, um, and then they were presented to all the parents. So we have history night where all the parents will come through and watch their performances and watch their diorama, see their dioramas or their art pieces or, um, um, their, their movie trailers and things like that. And, um, that, that was a huge success. I'm hoping they kept that going. I think so, but we, you never know. But um, but so there were some things that I brought to the table that was accept was accepted. But um, I did get in trouble a lot. I pushed the envelope, and uh, so you know, to in short, <laughs> you asked me one simple question. I kind of start rambling, <laughs> but no, um, I know I love it. I love all of it. Yeah, but my class was very interactive, very fun, very loud, um, gamey, and um, and 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 I tried to cater to the the desires of how the students wanted to learn. Yeah. So I love that. So what shifted, like what, because here you are teaching public school, changing lives, making a difference. What happened where you decided that you're going to homeschool your kids and, you know, and so move away from the education system at, to unschooling, which, you know, as you know, is the most radical form <laughs> yeah. of homeschooling because we're both unschoolers. And I think that's how we met was talking about that. But anyway, exactly. um, how, what, what happened? Tell, talk about that well, bridge. So um, it's funny. I, I've, I've talked about this a few times, but I guess at, in my seasoned age, <laughs> but um, I, I feel like I have a little more clarity with it. So it started, it, it was my daughter. My daughter was going into um, kindergarten and I was nervous and I was, and I didn't realize why I was nervous at the moment. You know, I, I didn't feel the love um, that I, or the support at school. Um, like I said, I, I wasn't the most favorite. The kids absolutely adored me. The parents absolutely adored me. The administration, I think tolerated me and my, and my peers, my peers, they, they weren't too fond um for various reasons and um and and I and I was like man I'm not sure if I want to do this right I'm very I'm very intrinsically motivated my my wife says you know I I'm a high what does she say I'm a high needs worker right so I need to feel appreciated I need to feel success and excellence I need to feel like I'm making a difference you know um, I need to be in line with my purpose. And I feel like yeah. I'm a very spiritual person. So I feel like God's put me on this planet to help people. I, I genuinely feel like that's my, that, that's my purpose. And when, um, it became, it came to my daughter, um, I recognized that, oh, wait, I'm an outlier as a teacher. Most teachers aren't like oh, me. Absolutely. And, and I want my daughter to experience what I present in math. And I know I didn't teach math, but in science and, and, uh, or history or, or whatever reading, I want her to experience this flexible, creative, passionate, like love for the learner first. And that's a lucky draw. Like every, everyone who's going to, um, to any traditional school, not just public school, but private school as well, they know that you get that wrong teacher and particularly in elementary and it's a wrap. You, you're just struggling for that whole year. And, and then when you start switching classes, if you get those couple of, you know, teachers that, um, aren't as passionate and loving and, and, and flexible, malleable to the, to the learner, like it's, it's difficult. And, and I saw the sadness, the, the frustration, and this was before COVID, right? Um, after COVID, it was way worse, but, um, but, I, and I saw like, I would try to present. And, and I remember one of the students came to say, Mr. Williams, you're the best part of my day. And we, it was like coming into this class, like literally he walked into class and he took, he's like, breathe in. 
Mr. Williams, you're the best part of my day. And I was like, thanks, bro. He was like, hell no, seriously, Mr. Williams. Like, I guess, it, and, and I was like, it's tough. And he's like, yeah, it's tough. Like he's all of his other teachers, all of his other classes, it was just, it was murderous for him, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I kept, I kept picturing like, do I really want my daughter to go through that? Yeah. You know? Um, and so I was thinking, all right, let's go to, uh, cause you know, this, it's a far journey from being a public school, middle school teacher to unschooling. Right. So yeah. the next step Huge was, jump. let's go to, um, uh, um, uh, Montessori. Montessori. That's different. They're innovative. They allow you to be selective with your learning and things like that. And, but there's still, I, and, and I realize I, uh, uh, a, a big issue for me and a, which is a big issue for a lot of the kids is the test, the testing, mm -hmm. um, the, the, these arbitrary, oh, you got, you learned this standard. Like when it, when we are really honest with each other, when we're, if we're, if, if we as a society are truly genuinely honest with each other and a really is not acceptable like just what what a kid does to get an a is not enough mm -mm. because get this they learn that material and this this is another thing i found in my class they learn that material to get that a let's say the to um in march right march 2024 right and then by uh june 2024 they don't know it so what if that was your doctor that's performing your brain surgery. And he got that A, you know what I mean? In March, you know what I mean? And he hasn't done anything. Now you're in June and he's going to do surgery on your brain. It's like, no, sir, I'm okay. Not so good. <laughs> this is, it's not a real, it's, it's not real. It's not real. And that's what I realized. Like these grades aren't real because these students are just learning the game, just like I did. They learned the game. They figured it out. Oh, to get off my back, all I have to do is memorize this for this 20, 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours. All right, I'll do that for that test and and ace it. Mom's off my back. Teacher's off my back. Actually, no, they're giving me awards for it because I'm smart. And I was like, that's not real intelligence, though. That's just yeah. great memorization, you know? And um, so it shifted from different types of because there was a school that was I'd applied for um that's a private school it's like one of the um most prestigious prestigious private schools down here and they do all project-based learning it's all I was like that's it no you know no test project-based learning they do huge community projects and they're making an impact in the community so it's like it's something attached to the learning which is one of the things that I did um that I was extremely excited about we I had the kids make a book to um, sell and um, whereas their works in the book, um, it was a, like a collaborative uh, works in their book and they were selling, they were going to sell the book to um, be used for the, uh, what was it? The international justice mission, because we were talking about slavery in some, some aspect. And they realized, now I was like, do you realize there's still slavery going on? They're like, what? there's still slavery. Oh my goodness. Well, you got to do something about it. It was like, okay, let's do something about it. Let's there's yes, a, we there's, should. Yeah. there's an the, the, there's a international entity that literally does something about it. The international justice mission about um, human trafficking and all this kind of stuff. And I showed them like uh, these videos about it. And it was like, Oh my goodness, we want to put it We want to help them. We want to help them. So they created this amazing book. They, we had a director, we had the illustrators, we had photographers, like in, in all kids, it was all kids work. The book, I might even have it somewhere around here, but the book was this beautiful little pamphlet book. And um, so we were going to sell, we were going to sell this and give the, all the proceeds to the international justice mission. The school shut it down. They said, we can't have cop that. It was something about the publishing's rights and what they were requesting for the sh students work. Um, it, it was like, it's, it was really, really frustrating. So that, that one, so that in that moment, I found a school that would have accepted something like that. So I told that same story to an, a teacher administrator. It's like, oh, we love that. That is exactly what we want to do and blah, blah, blah in our school. And, and I said, this might be it. This is the school, right? And then I'll have my daughter in a school where they're more creative with their type ways of presenting their information. And um, so I don't know why, but... Um, so me and my wife, we were going on a walk and we, we go on a lot of walks. So it's, we, you know, it's nice weather here and uh, we love uh, just walking in our neighborhood and we were going on a walk and something just didn't feel right. 
And I said, I, I sent my resume in and I had a great conversation with the school, that other school. And, um, but I, I'm nervous. And she was like, why? I was like, because what if she doesn't get a teacher that's willing to accommodate her, you know, and her needs? Like, yeah, you can do amazing projects and have an amazing mission, but if you don't have a teacher with patience, yeah, like, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing, you know? And, and, and I was like, okay, if we go, if she goes to this school, yes, it heightens the chance that she's going to get that teacher, but just me being animated and funny and, and making cool projects isn't my strength. I felt like my strength was my patience um, and my passion to consistently work with someone until they got that mastery, true mastery, where they tr not just remembered it, but understood it right? That concept that we were trying to get. And in school, the way school is set up, you're not really allowed that. Like, if 80% of the class gets it, I'm an exceptional teacher. I'm a high performing teacher. And I get bonuses based on that. If 80% of the class can remember something for a weekend, what kind of standard is that? For me, that was like, that's not enough. 80%. What about the other 20%? Yeah. And what, what about, about those kids? Exactly. You Oh, we just, oh, those kids don't matter. Oh, you know, it's like, it was really for, I was like, I want a hundred percent. I don't want 80%. And I don't want it, them just to remember it for a week or two weeks. I want them to remember it for the rest of their lives. Because if this truly is important, if this is a true standard for their foundation of their education, they need to know this forever. All right. They need to be able to learn this forever, or at least be able to go back and relearn it if they need to like that. All right. Well, well um, um, based on their need. And so um, I was like, I don't know if this is right. I don't know if I want to roll the dice on my daughter getting a teacher uh, of of my of of my standard. And my wife was like, okay. And a couple weeks later, uh, there was a friend of mine who mentioned. Um, um, I spoke to a friend from college, excuse me, and she said, uh, uh, oh, I'm um, uh, I'm a unschooler. Oh, I said, oh, cool. You're a homeschooler. She's like, no, I'm an unschooler. I was like, what's that? And she was like, and she started explaining. I was like, that's it. It was like, that's it. I, yeah. I was like, because I was working in this box. There's this quote from this rapper. Um, I'm going to butcher the quote. But he says, if you look around your circle and you're not inspired, you're in a cage. And wow. I felt like I was in a cage because my circle, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time around. And um, when I walk into that school building, I was not inspired by anyone. I, I looked around and I felt like I was in a cage because we had these restraints on what we can do and how we can do it instead of allowing these learners to truly blossom the way they should. And um and when, you know, a friend, friend of mine mentioned and started explaining more about what unschooling was, I was like, yeah, this is it. We need to take, we need to take this cage away from me and my family. And that's when my wife, and I explained it to my wife, my wife's like, no, no. And then, <laughs> and, then, um, and then she thought about it a little bit. And I was like, so he, he, this was like the final. So it started with my daughter and then my experience and then my friend introducing unschooling. But this was the final thing. Me and her, we did everything right. We live in a beautiful house. We have two kids. We've had a dog. We have a swimming pool. We have an amazing life, but something still didn't feel right. She didn't feel right. She didn't feel like she had enough. She didn't feel, she still felt anxiety. She still felt frustration. She still um, feels like, oh, I'm not doing enough as a mother. She feels like, oh, I'm, maybe I'm not living in my purpose based on God's plan for me. Like she still felt this way. And I felt this way. And it was like, we did it all right. Why aren't we feeling satisfied? Why we we went to college, we got the degrees, we got the jobs and are doing great work in our careers and we still feel this emptiness. And um and I feel like that's because that emptiness was never addressed as a child. Kids, we naturally, kids naturally feel that emptiness. 
by exploring, by asking questions, by experiencing different things, by um, by um, finding the things and following the, their natural passions. They they feel that emptiness. They learn about themselves. They learn about the people around them, their siblings, their parents, their grandparents, their cousins. And it's so much more emphasis on the relationship of them, them to uh, people around them and them to themselves. And that's what we were missing. And I was like, my family is going to emphasize that. They're going to emphasize that relationship between everyone around them and that relationship with yourself. We're going to, that's going to be our priority. And that, um, and with that understanding with, sorry to be preaching, but with God as our guide and God as our core and what we're doing, um, I feel like that's when that happy, happiness will be there and that emptiness will be full of joy, peace, and love. So, Amen. Yeah. I love that. Oh, I went too okay. long. No, no, preach, preach away because I, like it's for those that listen to my podcast re regularly, I don't shy away from the fact that I believe in God. Like I, I, I don't because it's part of who, who I am That's me. and it's part of who you are, you know? And so, so let's talk about, okay, when did you leave the school system and then shifting into the unschooling with your daughter? So, so when I left the school system, that was, so COVID happened. So all of this kind of led right before COVID. Um, literally, I think we were that walk that I was telling you about was like a week before the world shut down March 2020. And um, and then, you know, we had so much time because everything stopped, like yeah. the world stopped. So I really honestly, if COVID doesn't happen, I don't know if I'm quite make this jump, even with everything. Like, I, I'm not sure because the world just stopped and my life stopped. And I was able to basically, as an adult, unschool for that summer, and yes. um, and or de technically it was de-schooling, but unschooling, but it was a little bit of both. And um, so when we finally went back to school to the classroom, and then I realized, all right, this whole process of going back to the classroom where some remote, and then we had hybrid, and then you had to work all the mess, yeah, and the Zoom classes, and it was just, yeah, I was like, this is not it, this is not it, yeah. And I realized the, sorry, I, I'm not trying to get political, but I, I feel like there was a clear um, emphasis on the country, the workforce going back to work. And it wasn't a focus on developing and cultivating the young minds of these students. And that was extremely clear to me. And that was like the final straw. I was like, I do not subscribe to this at all. I actually feel like this is harmful and hurtful to all of these people. And when I really think about it, when I truly think about it, I went through that horror and I made it out despite like everyone who's like, oh, sorry, but everyone who's like, oh, go ahead, now speak. Oh, I, I did it and I'm a doctor and I'm a lawyer and I'm this and I'm a politician. I was like, and I do this great thing and that great thing. And it's like, okay, if you are genuinely happy in that, right? I feel like you made it despite the school system, the the, yeah. the educate our education system. It's not a true way for you to um, truly become the best version of yourself. So you remember, that was always my focus from the beginning, from helping that little kid playing kickball back in the days, just help him become good at something that he was genuinely passionate about, right? And so um, I completely, I said, I, I wanted to step away and there was a kid. And, and so when we came back into school um, for COVID and so it was like hybrid uh, half, well, most of the year, pretty much all of the year, it wasn't a full classroom yet. So half of the kids were on a computer and the other half were in the classroom. It, it was the weirdest setup. I don't know. Did you get a chance to do that by the way? Do you, I pulled my kids the summer of 2020 yes. when I didn't like I, I ran into my middle school kids principal and said, uh, Hey, what's, what's, what's the plan? <laughs> and he's like, I don't know. It could be hybrid. It could, I have no idea. And I, I, ha I was at church a couple of weeks later and this thought came, you need to homeschool the kids. And then I talked to everyone I knew that day that homeschooled like all three people <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and then I, it just came with great. And I feel like it was, I feel like it was the spirit guiding me that mm -hmm. I needed to do this. So 
within two days after that. And it came with force, you know, and I talked to my husband about it and he's like, okay, let's do this. Two days later, withdrew the kids and everybody else went into hybrid learning that fall and parent after parent after parent that I talked to just expressed what a disaster it was, you know, for their kids. And they were isolated. And even in the classroom, they were, you know, seven feet apart, not even just six feet apart and isolated from each other. And their kids were depressed. And my kids in the meantime, you know, we were on our own homeschooling journey. And that was kind of a mess at the beginning, but, um, but my kids were happy. Mm. And, and that's where I, I looked at my friend's kids and I hadn't been teaching for quite a, quite a few years. So, okay. but, but it was hybrid here in Colorado and you're in, you're in Florida. Yep. yep. I mean, we didn't mention that to the listeners. So you're in Florida, we're in Colorado and it was hybrid learning for, for our kids here in our school district and each school district kind of chose what they wanted to do, but it was a mess yeah, and I felt bad for the teachers. I felt bad for the kids, but my kids were doing comparatively great yeah emotionally awesome you know um but we were a mess in our homeschooling going i don't know what i'm doing here we are <laughs> you know so anyway yeah. but back to back to you yeah. so, was that was, because that's that first year you were still teaching so yeah right? i was so 2021 i was still teaching um and um that was my last year and the, so there was a uh we had still had homerooms and um, so there was a, a student who came to my class and it, it was a real small setting because you remember half the class mm-hmm. school is there. And um, they asked me, Mr. Williams, do we really need to learn this stuff? And if someone asked me that question a couple years ago, I would have said a different answer. But in that <laughs> moment, I said, no, you don't. And they were like, why? And I, and I said, because you're really not going to remember it anyway. Um, and, um, and if you're not genuinely interested and passionate about it, you're basically wasting your time. And I feel like time is our most, one of our most important, uh, commodities and not, and, and that moment I was like, yeah, this is it. I'm done. Um, and my wife came to me a little bit after that and said, um, Jay, I, you're not happy. Um, you're not, you're so, you're, you're such a, 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 a purpose driven person. And I can see that you feel like you're not moving in your purpose right now. So, um, what, how about we've done very well for ourselves and I, and over 2020 and during 2020, I wanted to learn about real estate and video editing. So that's when I started my YouTube and all this kind of stuff. And I also started a real estate business, investing in real estate after that. And it did exceptionally well. Well, I think most people know, like between 2020 and like everybody's property values, like skyrocketed. I was like, Woo, we're rich, but we weren't rich, but you know, but it went, it did well. It did really well. And, um, and she was like, we've done well. Um, and between my job and the real estate business, we can sustain, right? Um, why don't you stay home? and unschool the kids. And I was like, no, <laughs> like what? <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, I think I j- joked in one of my videos, you, you think I'm a desperate housewife or something, you know, like hooking up with the pool boy? Like, no, this, no, I'm good. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. But, um, and then I realized, I was like, okay, it's my ego. You know, God sat me down like, all right, Jay, you know, um, you know, and I remember like praying about it and, um, you know, I was like, a man's job is to protect and provide. Like, am I protecting and providing for my family? You know, if my wife is the main breadwinner and I'm home, you know, raising kids, like this reverse role thing. And um, it was like, almost like it just heard a voice or whatever. Just this thought came to my head where, you know, protection and provision is more than financial. Like a lot of times we just think, oh yeah, that's just a financial thing. You just, but how many, I mean, all of us know of that father who worked his butt off and, and provided, gave everything to their kids financially, but the kids still wanted, right? They wanted their time and that attention. They wanted that extra hug. You know, they wanted those extra moments with them, you know? And, um, and I realized, yeah, okay, I am going to protect and provide, but it's not going to look the way uh, society has deemed that it should look. It's going to look a little different for our family. 
And um, and so that was the sh final shift um, to going to unschooling. And um, when when we started unschooling, it was it was different. Man, this journey's been so. It's wow. We could do a three hour podcast. Sorry, but um, no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Keep talking. Um, so when we started unschooling, um, it was out, you know, just like anything, new toy, right? You got your new toy. It was like, yeah, we want to play it every day. And I was like, all right, kids, we have no rules. What do you want to do today? Playground, yeah. So we go into the playground. It was like every day. And it, we live in Florida and South Florida. So it's like, so this is the summer. Like, so I finished the school year. So this is the summer. So we hear, so we go to the play, you go into the playground. It's 95 degrees outside, like the humidity, like crazy. Like my kids are like, like Dad, I don't want to go on the playground anymore. It's too hot. Two minutes. You're there two minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, that's funny because we actually call it the two-minute playground <laughs> but because um, it's two minutes away and we only could be out there two minutes before we exhausted. But, um, yeah, so, uh, so, you know, we tried everything. And then it was like, all right, let's do indoor things. So we – we did every museum. We've been to so many museums and, and then I was videotaping. Oh, and this will be great footage for my YouTube channel. So I was videoing everything and, and, um, and, you know, and I was editing videos and posting them online and, and everything. And the kids would, you know, we, we just had this amazing appearing life. Right. And, um, but it still didn't feel right. It, 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 it um, it wasn't it. We were doing it for the wrong reasons. I was doing it <clears throat> to look like I was this amazing dad um, on YouTube to people that I never met, subscribers that I don't I no diff, no who offense, but I don't I don't care about them. I shouldn't be caring about them more than what you know um, I should be doing every day and my life purpose and the developing and cultivation of my kids um, and you know loving and supporting my wife. Um, so. Uh, and I realized I was like, yeah, so we, we toned it back. So we went from almost every day, our schedule being packed with just doing stuff to, um, we spent probably a year. So we, it, we tapered down, but we spent probably a year doing nothing like sitting around the house, you know, watching TV, playing Uno, playing Catan, playing, you know, just little games just at the house. Um, and, and we needed that time to detox, to de-school. Um, we, the, the, these arbitrary, I use, you use that word too much. That's a, that's an unschool word, arbitrary, right? Um, yeah, it's true. Yeah, that's such a word, unschool word. But these, these, um, unnecessary rules and expectations about when a kid should learn something and how they should learn something. And I went completely against that intentionally like I, I i was very adamant so i was i was radical in that sense a radical unschooler in that sense where it was like we're not going to i don't care if you don't learn how to read you know like it's i'm going to humble myself and not feel like have to the need for my daughter to be this high performing student you know um if you genuinely aren't interested in it you don't have to do it that's okay yep. and um and so that journey and me just saying, hey, I'm going to cater to how you want to learn kind of gradually built up to where we are now. And man, it's amazing. Like, so year one was was either super intense with doing all these amazing things to absolutely doing nothing for, you know, the last six months of the year one to um, the first six months of year two, year two was super in, introspective. Like, so um, one of my um, videos that I did, um, it, it's like, I realized this whole unschooling journey was more about me than it was my kids. I realized it's about me understanding and finding and connecting to um, me and genuinely liking me as a person um, and, um, and being okay with, uh, not appearing a certain way. Um, it's, it, it's kind of hard to describe. And I, I feel like I, I'm a reasonably articulate person, but when I start talking about this stuff, you know, it's, it's real, it's, it was, I, I joke, you know, a lot of times it's, it's like therapy, you know, 
um, sometimes some of those videos are really like therapy for me. And uh, I remember, so year two for me was very dark. It was, and cause I, I'm a, <laughs> so I think about the most, the, it, I have the most dark mind ever. The, I have dark <laughs> humor. Um, I think about the worst thing. I always plan for the worst possible thing. I literally, I joke with the kids when I was in a classroom, I was like, I have a, I know exactly what I'm going to wear if there's a zombie apocalypse. I, I know I have an outfit <laughs> is, is right in my right corner of my closet. I know what shoes I'm wearing and I have a, my zombie apocalypse bat. And you know, it's, it's like this weighted bat. Um, but uh, <laughs> so it's like, I, I'm just, I just always think about the worst case situations and, and with everything. And so imagine you have all this time, right. Um, you know, and your kids and, and you just are in your head. And, um, and it took me to very darker places and I needed to go to those places to find where I wanted to be in this spectrum of life, you know, in this spectrum of J, you know, and, um, and, and, and it was so refreshing while I'm going through this, my wife is going through it. My children are going through it and we're all coming to this place of joy, peace, and in closeness with our with our purpose with our heavenly father and um and so as we shifted out of that second year and now we're in my third year it's everything's very clear you know we our days are full with how we want to fill our days and who we want to fill our days with and um and we're seeing the benefits of that as well we're seeing whether it be some of it is financial others other times it's relational you know uh, that's a big thing that you know our relationship i talked about like you know with ourselves but also with each other is really important you know mm -hmm. when you know saying hurtful words or doing hurtful things and and understanding truly understanding why that's not okay as a five-year-old and eight-year-old siblings right why that's not okay as you know me um, as a, the father or adult, you know, and, and under and caring about my daughter's feelings, you know, and how, and her boundaries and things like that. It, it's, we, our relationships have gotten so strong and mm -hmm. that's, the, that's probably the biggest, the, the greatest, uh, um, thing that I would say this unschooling experience has had is this amazingly tight relational relationships with my family and with myself. Like mm -hmm. I am so balanced. I am so grounded and firm and unshaken. It's, it's like anything could happen. All right. So I'm going to get dark. Is that okay? Get, yeah, go ahead. So please, I, go I ahead. coach basketball um, and I coach at a basketball team and uh, we're just an average team. And one of my players uh, tried to kill himself two days ago. Oh, I'm so sorry. And when I got the news um, from another player said, hey, coach, you know, um, this, you know, the player, you know, I think he's going to try to end his life. And I was and I said, um, why do you say that? He said he sent all of us like letters. And I was like, what? Well, so he sent like text letters, messages to all of them and saying how, why he loves everybody and all everything. And, um, and I'm reading through it and, uh, and I was like, okay, so I'm like, you know, scrambling, like, let me get him on the phone. You know, did, did it happen already? Is it going to happen? You know, and I'm calling his mom and, and everything and I'm reaching nobody. So I just said, I'm just going to keep calling him. So I just kept calling, kept calling and his brother picks up and they said, Hey, uh, coach, we're in the ambulance right now. He's okay. He did, he took some pills or something and, um, and we're taking them to the hospital. I'll send you the location once we get there. So they send me the location, you know, I quickly rushed to go and, um, to the hospital and sounds weird, Janae, but I started smiling. I'm like on the car ride and I'm like, I was so, I was happy. I was like, wait, and I'm really close to this kid. Like. I genuinely love this kid. I love a lot, all of my players, but like, I'm really close to this kid. 
um, he says like, coach, you're like a father figure to me. And he has a weird relationship with his dad, similar to I have. And we related in that sense. And he, um, and I, I don't know, I was just like, I felt like such a peace and a calm. And I was like, when I walk through that door and I see him in the hospital, I'm going to smile. And I walked in and I saw him and I had this big smile on my face. And then he, so he, you know how kids like try not to smile. He was like, when he looked at me and he was like, try to hold it back. I'm like, bro, it's okay, bro. It's okay. <laughs> Just smile. And he was like, man, I love you, coach. I'm like, yeah, I love you too, bro. And I was like, man, it was so I joked, um, and I'm probably going on a tangent, but so he sent a letter to all the kids on the t- basketball team, like something about that he loved for all of them. But you, if you've been around a group, particularly boys, they don't all love each other. So there's one kid on the team <laughs> that I know they really don't like each other. And he sent a love, I said, uh, he sent, I said, you sent a love letter to this kid? And you didn't send one to me. <laughs> you actually love me. <laughs> how how are you gonna send one to him and not me? I'm mad at you, bro. I want my love letter. He was like, "Man, coach, what are you doing?" And he was like, he, "We just cracked and we just joked and um, smiled." And I, I I was only able to because you, know, you know they do the Baker acting, so I was only able to be with him about fifteen to twenty minutes. But the whole time it was just just this joy and love, and we hugged each other like four or five times. And we're just smiling and laughing and cracking jokes. And he was like, I don't know what they have in my IV, but all your jokes are funny right now, coach. I was like, <laughs> I was like yeah, they got that good stuff in there, bro. But, um, but yeah, so it was just, and, I, and it's like, I don't know if I have that level of strength for him without my experience these last few years. Like there's just my connection to my purpose, to my heavenly father to my family and to all the relationships I have is so strong now that even the idea of a kid that I absolutely adore, like I literally was, I mean, I'm going a tangent. I was strongly considering having that kid live in my house because there was a situation that popped up. Fortunately, we didn't have to, but, um, and I spoke to my wife about it and my kids and they were all on board. Yeah, we love this kid. No, let him live in our house, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and, so I'm really close with this guy. And, you know, to have this kind of feeling, like, I think that's something that we're missing in our the way we live our lives now. We're so this hustle and bustle. We're so, oh, let's do it for Instagram. And we're so in appearances. We're so in, oh, we got to reach this standard and teach this and learn this and get to this place. And, oh, and then when we get there, life is going to get easier. Life there's this quote, this uh, high school uh, uh, college coach says, life never doesn't get easier. You just get better at dealing with hard. And, wow. and so it's like, I feel like my experience with unschooling has really allowed me to get better dealing with difficult situations because you don't get much more difficult than that. And the peace, the balance that I was able to provide him in that moment, in his probably literally his darkest moment, right? Um, that is why I do this. This is why I have this been on this journey. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So, so I think one thing interesting too, is like, it didn't happen all at once. Like you had to go through a couple of years of hard and dark and soul searching. And I think yeah. f- for me, that was one thing that shocked me was like the, the, t- the, the, the process of taking the braces off my brains and, and waking up. Cause I felt like I told my sister that one day I said, I feel like I'm waking up out of this really dark sleep or like a really deep sleep. Sorry, not a dark sleep, but mm-hmm. a deep sleep. But that whole, that first couple of years is hard, especially the first year for us was, it was terrible <laughs> and painful and awful. And, and yet my kids were happy. Like that's the crazy part. Yeah. But I feel like coming out on the other side is so beautiful. And I didn't, I didn't know I could be as close to my family as I am, mm. you know, like even with my kids giving me a hard time about stuff, yeah. you know, they tease me about stuff all the time, but, yeah. um, 
but we're close and, but it took like, it took a couple of years of figuring out and the braces coming off my brains and the waking up and the, and I, and I think your experience going into that dark place is not unusual. Yeah. You know, as I talk to more and more parents who pull their kids, they're like, oh man, it got hard and dark and I cried. And yeah. I think that's, I think that's pretty, pretty typical. But the other side is where the beauty comes is getting through taking the braces off our brains and taking off the expectations and take, you know, removing the shackles. Yeah. It's, it's, that's where the, it's, um, are you familiar with uh Plato's allegory of the cave? No, yeah. please share. So, um, so Plato, uh, he wrote the Republic, uh, he's a Greek philosopher and, um, he had this allegory, um, of the cave where, so, uh, you're in a cave and you're watching, uh, shadows, on the wall. So it's a dark, dark cave. And the only light in the cave is this like little candle that's behind you kind of flickering. And you keep hearing sounds and you see shapes that are casted on the shadow of the wall. Right. Um, and so you're there for all of your existence and all of your experience as a human being is being shackled, um, and seeing the shadows on the wall and you know, there are people behind you, you can feel them, you can hear them. And they're all shackled watching the same shadows on the wall that you're watching. And then, um, one person, um, some way breaks out of their shackles and they're blind. So it's dark and they're like trying to find their way out and they see a light at the end. Um, and they go toward the light. Um, but the light isn't the the little candle flickering behind you. It's like it's the exit of the cave. So they're going as they go closer to the exit, that light gets bigger and bigger, brighter and brighter. But remember, they've never seen real natural light. They've only seen the candle um, flickering behind them. So it's painful. If it's it's you know it's just it's almost like when you uh, close your eyes and you unblind um, um um or are blindfolded and you take that off and you have the sun in your eyes. It's like it's, it hurts, right? And it takes. Um, as he's getting closer and closer, he's actually getting more and more blind by the light, right? Even though it's brighter, but he's not used to that and, or they're not used to that. And, um, so they finally get outside of the cave and they look up and they're absolutely blinded by everything, but they can hear things. And it's like so much clearer than when they were in a cave hearing those sounds and they can smell things. And it's so much more rich than when you were smelling the things in, in the in the cave, right? And then, uh, um, but they can't see anything. They're completely blind. And then gradually their eyes slowly adjust. And the, now these, these, these bright images um, are blurry and then they get clearer and clearer and clearer. And they finally can see. And they're seeing the birds and the trees and the leaves and they're seeing the horses go by and they're, they're seeing, hearing the water um, of the river. And it's like they're in awe of how beautiful this thing is. But and that's what I feel like and the Plato's whole um, purpose of this allegory is like this is our minds. Our minds are in a cave shackled, like you said, take the braces off your brain, shackled. Um, seeing shadows on the wall, but we're not seeing the real thing. And we need to unleash our minds from these standards, from these, 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 these social experiments, from these uh, uh, expectations, from these uh, um, um, ungodly or unpurposeful um, thoughts and, and perversions and make it to out of the cave to see the true beauty of God's creation, of nature, of the sky, of the clouds, of the trees, of the water rushing, of the, the smells of the earth and, and the fragrances of, 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 of the world. And, um, and that's what I feel like that, like, and I, I still feel like I'm still in the blurry, but it's bright stage. Like, I don't feel like I've seen it, seen it yet, you know, but, um, but that allegory of the cave is, I think about it all the time, it, it, representative of this unschooling journey, um, because it, it, it's this, it's this, this um, uh, enlightenment or this revelation of, of the world that I was in mentally, emotionally, and how there was this disconnect between that um, is not what we should be, have been experiencing. We should be experiencing something deeper, brighter, more vivid, you know, more passionate, more fulfilling. 
um like you know the like the distance the difference between being in a cave watching shadows versus um standing at the edge of the of niagara falls or something you know or standing at the base of of or the the peak of pike's peak you know looking down to um this vast valley you know it's 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 you know it's it's something that um I really want, and people get mad at me when I say this, but you know, they like ask, Oh, is unschooling for everyone? And I say yes, because that like taking those, like you using your phrase, taking those braces off of your mind, stepping out of that cave, right? And experiencing that transition to this beautiful world, this beautiful mind, this beautiful connection with our mind, body, spirit together. Like I feel like that's what we should be putting our kids in for 180 days and six hours a week for that process, that difficult, like, I'm not saying I don't want my kids to go through rigor and challenge and frustrations. I want them to go through that because I had to go through that to go through that cave. Right. I, but I want them to go through it and not just be stuck in those restraints for, uh, you know, their whole lives. So. I love that. I love that. A yeah. uh, couple things before we finish up. Uh, talk about your daughter a little bit. And that first year, uh, when we, we had talked the other day and you were telling me the story about her with reading, mm -hmm. cause I know a lot of parents are like, what if they never learned to read, which we're in a very literacy rich society. Yeah. It's almost impossible to not learn. To, well, I mean, 40% of high school students are coming out, not reading. So mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> I guess it's happening, <laughs> but let's talk about your daughter's experience, your experience with your daughter and reading So my as an example. Yeah. So my daughter, um, we, like I said, we went radical when we first came out and I asked her, I, I was so young. <laughs> I was like, it's only a couple of years ago, but I was so immature. And I said, um, so do you want to read? Um, cause I think at the time she was reading like little Clifford books, the, you know, the little, mm -hmm. you know, with the big red dog. And, um, and she was like, Nope, I don't want to learn how to read. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> we're not reading. <laughs> let's, let's go to the playground and pass out. And yeah. But, um, so, so, <laughs> the playground, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we didn't push reading at all. Um, and that lasted about a year and she saw her friends right so her friends all of her friends are still in school and um um not even homeschool and excuse me and so she saw them progressing like our, there was a close friend of mine and you know uh he he always bragged about his daughter it was like man my daughter reads on a fourth grade level she's in kindergarten and blah 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 blah, blah. i was like oh that's awesome and i was honestly i was genuinely happy for him you know because yeah i feel like a, a kid doesn't do that unless they're really passionate and have a natural mm -hmm. knack for it you know so that's true great that's job true. great job you know um that she found her passion in this horrible <laughs> society no i'm joking but but, uh, <laughs> but but great job good job and um and i and but my daughter you know she's kind of like her dad, you know, we playing Uno all the time. She's really competitive, you know, and I don't think she liked the idea that she wasn't able to do certain things. And that was a trigger for her. So she said, um, she came to me and she's like, dad, um, I want to learn how to read. I go on her own. She's like, I want, I want to like really focus on reading. And I want you to be the teacher, dad. I was like, I don't know how to teach reading. I'm not a reading teacher at all. I didn't, I'm a, I'm a, a secondary middle school. I could teach you social studies. I could teach you, you know, history. Um, but I can't teach you reading, but I said, okay, let's try. So we tried, um, different reading programs and stuff and she did good. Right. Um, actually I was extremely excited because she went from barely being able to read to basically reading chapter books. And, um, she needed help. She needed assistance, you know, um, um, but she could, and she loved, and we ne we kept, even though we didn't read a lot, force her to read, we kept an environment of reading. So we read every night, um, every day, um, like, like it's clockwork every day, at least yeah. 20, yep. 30 minutes at least. Right. Um, and, um, sometimes more, a lot more. And, um, so there was always, so there was always books and always reading and always time for that, that time. And, um, so she was really into the reading her little, uh, A to Z mystery books or whatever. And, um, and, um, so we read, I think we read all of them, A to Z, but maybe a couple times, but, uh, and, um, uh, we, but we noticed it wasn't, she never got extremely fluent 
and fluid in it. I'm probably using the wrong term. Reading teachers <laughs> probably correct. Yeah. Let me know. But um, but she never got very extremely fluid with it. And we felt like she was hitting the ceiling, you know, and it was like, this is weird because all my unschooling books I've read, kids will learn how to read in the summer, you know, with 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 motivation and things like that. So it's like, so why isn't why well, she's she's reading, but it's like, you know what I mean? It's not quite. Yeah, it's, you know? she's just missing the mark. Yeah. barely. And yeah. it's like it was weird. So um, and she loves reading. She absolutely loves reading. And um, like, so, like I said, these ABC mystery, they're chapter books, you know, have like, you know, 80, 90 pages in them. Um, then she, she loves Hamilton. She loves theater. That's why she's, you're, you're, she don't even know, but you're like her favorite person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, like you're going to be one of her favorite adults. I, I, I know if, if she's blessed to ever meet you one day, um, you'll be one of her favorite adults, but you know, she loves theater and like, she's so animated and, you know, humor is like such a big deal for her. And, um, so she loves Hamilton, right? Um, her mom, um, they watch Hamilton. They literally know the words to all the songs and stuff. Awesome. And she wanted, um, they're going to see it actually in a week or two. Um, it's coming, oh. coming here. So they're going to see it live. Um, the kids, the kids are going, my wife has seen it already and cried and all that kind of stuff. But she's like, I want to see it again. They got to experience this. So anyways, um, so she got the, this book, it's like this thick, sorry, where's the camera? So this, this book, it's like this thick of all the 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 background stories the 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 script screenplay um 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 and everything so it's like everything all the lyrics to all the songs everything right and she's reading it she's like halfway through <laughs> oh that's what she that's wants so to read right and this is like this hamilton wasn't made for kids you know no it, wasn't. it was this is an adult thing it's like an encyclopedia about uh this hamilton um alexander hamilton in this play and and the history of it and the context and everything um and and then manuel um even creating his his masterpiece but um but she she loves it right she wants to read it every night and um and the other day um she we we're reading it and the word was um uh the word was s h o w show and she kept saying wash wash well wash and i was like wait why is she putting the w and i know the w makes the was sound but why is she doing that and the fact that like we spend so much time reading and like we were able to recognize oh i think she may be dyslexic and so we went to um, my wife, my wife's super into researching and stuff like that. So she researched who's the, what, what she needs to get tested and blah, 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 blah. How do we figure this out? What do we do? Blah, blah, blah. And who's the best specialist for it? And so we found this lady um, here in South Florida and um, she's amazing. She's very theatric personality and big. And my, my daughter absolutely loves her. And um, so she goes, almost said the lady's name. I'm sorry. But so she goes to um, the reading a uh, teacher uh, twice a week. And like my daughter, she has her folder. She She's never been to school, by the way. <laughs> Even during COVID years, she went, they, she was hybrid. She was at home. So she's never been, but she has her notebook and she's ready. She's ready. She wants to go. She's so she's like, daddy, we got to go. If we're going to be there, we got to leave an hour before so we could be there. Hour? <laughs> it's only 40 it's minutes. It's, it's only 30 minutes away. We don't need to leave an hour before. Like, I want to be there early, dad. But um, so it's like, she's so motivated to be with her reading tutor, you know, and, um, and, and I don't think the, 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 you know, it's all about perspective and presentation, right? I don't think she has this learn love for learning and reading and Hamilton and learning how to read and helping to fix her dyslexia. Um, if that's what she has, we, we're not a hundred percent, but we think probably, um, yeah. I don't think she has that intrinsic motivation without this unschooling approach, right? I think if we forced it on her, if she was in a classroom and looked at as different or looked at as slow or low or, you know, um, you know, not high and her friends are high achieving and, and on a roll. And now, you know, what it was the quote, you know, comparison is the thief of joy, you know? And, um, yeah. you know, so it's, it's, if you have that element into it, you know, and kids picking on her, oh, because you know, you got to read out loud in class, right? And it's like, oh, you're, you, that was show. You said, waha, should And I was like, well, oh, you stupid, you're dumb, blah, blah. Like, if she had that experience, we don't get this. We don't, she's not, 
genuinely happy and excited about learning how to help her um, um, with reading, right? Something she genuinely doesn't like, but she loves at the same time, if that makes sense, you know, because she, yeah, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. She sees yeah. the value in it. She genuinely, as an eight-year-old young lady, sees the value in this. And, um, and that's, that's the part about this whole thing. That's just so like, I don't know. It, it, it's, it, it, it makes me feel like we absolutely did the right thing. We absolutely made the right call. Um, and was it scary? Was it dark? Particularly when she wasn't reading at all, of course. And I'm seeing every, all these other kids doing great, of course, but, um, my focus isn't on them. Um, my focus is on her and making sure she's in tune with the, her process and what she needs to learn and to grow and develop into the, the beautiful, amazing person that she's going to grow into. And, um, so, uh, this reading journey, which is weird because in one day she'll struggle reading show. And in another day she'll read this huge multisyllabic word. Uh, did I say that right? Multisyllabic or whatever. So, so uh, See, don't... All right, shh, don't tell nobody. We, <laughs> we're, we're a former theater and history teacher. We don't need to. Yeah. We're like, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that word. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so it's, it's, but yeah, so that, that's the journey that we've been on with her, uh, with her reading and, um, and my son, so my son, uh, he's five. He almost reads almost almost as much as her. He loves uh, um, Elephant and Pig. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Those are favorites in our household. Oh, yeah. they, they're, 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 they're hilarious. They're hilarious. They are hilarious. Whoever, they're so yeah, they, they, man, they, wow. They, I, if I would had a chance to make children's books, that's what I would do. Like literally, they, 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 they are masterful at that. But um. So, and, you know, so he's doing great at reading, but his thing is he really loves building robotics. Mm -hmm. He loves like, so there was a, we are, we have to, we're renovating our bathroom. Um, and we bought, you know, cause my wife and I are cheap. We bought vanities that were, weren't assembled and, uh, from Amazon. So we're like, you know, Ikea and this thing up, you know, trying to put it together. Yeah. Uh, um, and guess who, like my son is like, he was super, he's like, daddy, let's build the cabinets. Let's build the cabinets. I want to build the cabinets with you. I want to build the vanities with you. So he's like, he, he loves building, like absolutely loves building. So he's like use, wanting to use the drill and, and everything and this, you know, and everything. And it's, it's like, I, I'm almost a hundred percent. He's going to be an engineer, like in some, he's going to build something, you know, mm -hmm. and at five years old to be able, so we do Legos. He does the nine, 10 plus, you know, how Legos has a box 10 plus, nine mm -hmm. plus. He does those 30 minutes. He'll build it by himself. It, he used to need me, but he just builds it by himself. And, and it's, and it's funny because I love these moments. So there's times I'll be in a totally different room and he's down there at the main table and I, oh, oh, he's like, mad. I was like, why is he? And, and I know that feeling. Cause I love. I love building and creating too, which is why I have the YouTube channel and things like that. And I love editing and stuff. And, um, and I was like, I know he made a mistake and he has to like take multiple steps back. And he felt like he was so close. I, I knew exactly his feeling. Yeah. And, um, and then he was like, <clears throat> so he, I, I hear the steps, do, 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 do the little steps coming up the stairs. And he was like, daddy, <laughs> I was like, you, you messed up a part, huh? And he was like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> he wants to cry. Out. <laughs> and then, um, and I was like, so I told him I was, cause I used to have a, a really bad temper. So, um, nasal breathing. So I was like, um, almost said his name. So I was like, breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth and through your nose, out through your mouth. And then we do that five times. And I was like, how do you feel now? He's like, I feel good. <laughs> I was like, okay, take some steps back and you're going to have to take some of it apart, but you can put it back together. And he's like, okay, daddy, thank you. And he runs down the stairs and, that was and it. that's it, you know, but that connection to like his experience and his learning and his struggle and his rigor can, you know, that's a, you know, it's a uh, education term, you know, school term, right. You know, rigor, we want rigor. It was like, he experienced that, but he has the time to help him cope, um, to cope with that. And that's in his struggles, you know? And, um, so yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm extremely, uh, 
excited about how my kids are learning and and this unschooling process. It's been amazing for us. That is so, so awesome. Yeah. Okay, last thoughts, <laughs> things that you'd want to share with these parents, especially those that are still considering going, do I do I actually do this? Do I pull the kids? What would you say to them? Um, do it. <laughs> do it ASAP. Um, don't, don't, don't overthink it. It's okay. It's not going to look smooth. It's, it's going to look ugly at times. But when you get through that dark point, you will see the beauty and you'll be so frustrated you didn't do it sooner. Just trust the process. Trust the learner. Trust the child. Trust yourself. Because we as adults, particularly that went through the traditional schooling, we have to like take all these. We have more braces and more cages and more layers to take off than our kids. Our kids actually are super uh, accepting to it. Um, it's us that get in the way. Don't allow our fears, our fantasies and our failures to um, um, to stop you from living this amazingly joyful and purpose filled life. So, yeah. I love it. Jay, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to put your YouTube channel in the, in the show notes below. It's Black Dad is his YouTube channel. Jay Williams, thank you so much. Moms and dads, um, you heard it from Jay. <laughs> Give yourself time to take the braces off your brains. Do it. Do it sooner than later. Those of you that are in the mess right now know that there's light outside the cave. Mm. Mamas and dads, mamas and papas. <laughs> You got this. Have a great week. Thank you.